Welcome to Rich Planet TV. I'm Richard D. Hall. Now, in previous shows, we have discussed NASA's Apollo moon missions and presented a comprehensive set of evidence suggesting the Apollo crafts did not land on the moon. If you contend that statement, then please watch these two Rich Planet TV shows and see if you still hold that view after you've watched them. Now, in recent months, I've been collaborating with researcher Douglas Gibson, who has been investigating more of NASA's claimed projects, namely the Mars exploration missions. Starting in 1976 and up to the present day, NASA have allegedly landed a series of landers and rovers on the Martian surface, which have allegedly sent back photographs and other data to the Earth. Now I've been working on a hypothesis with the help of Douglas Gibson which is now running at 50 pages and you can download it from this link and it is entitled A Hypothesis The Opportunity and Curiosity Rovers are situated on Earth In fact, more specifically the Mars Exploration Rovers are not situated on the surface of Mars and never left the Earth As I say, you can download this 50 page document, this hypothesis um, from the link on the screen. How many other TV shows would you get a 50 page hypothesis of evidence to back up what we're talking about? Now here to discuss uh, the claims in the hypothesis is uh, researcher Andrew Johnson. Welcome Andrew. Thank you very much for inviting me Richard. Okay, um, now I mentioned the moon there Andrew and you're I would say convinced as you can be that the Apollo never went to the moon and we've gone through a lot of that evidence as to why you think that. Um, where do you stand on these Mars missions, Andrew? Well, it's very interesting to think about because, you know, I have done talks about the Mars missions as well, as you probably know, and some of the viewers perhaps have, have had a look around on the websites and stuff. So it's kind of, you know, once you've broken through the Apollo barriers, if you, if you want to call it that, and you realise that they there's no possible way that they could have done what they did, what they claim to have done on the moon, then, you know, you do have to open up yourself to the idea that perhaps uh, because of similar complications with technology, maybe these rover missions, you know, are not as claimed, certainly not as claimed. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of, I suppose, you know, you've rightly gone forward with your document mm -hmm. to try and explore where we get to when we look at the evidence and try and study it a bit more deeply with this deeply sceptical mindset that we come to having found out some of the huge problems with the Apollo record. Then I found the more I looked, the more the official version of, of the photographs, the official story behind them, started to fall apart. Right. Um, and it's been 18 months now and everywhere I look, it's, it's the same as the Apollo missions. I know most people still believe we went to the moon, but if you look really carefully at any single aspect of the science, it just it just comes apart. In the introduction, I set out the reasons why the reader should not just dismiss this uh, hypothesis, because a lot of people will do that. They'll be, and the reason they'll come up with is they'll say, well, why would they do that? There's no logical reason why they would possibly fake a, a, a mission uh, to Mars. Well. Let's look at the evidence before we decide why they've done yeah. it. Let's look at uh, yeah. what happened before we look at why they may have done it. Oh, it's a good and, uh, method, yes. Yeah, so investigation before condemnation. And we're going to do some of the investigating today. Um, we'll just start by having a quick look at um, uh, previous alleged missions to Mars. Now, we've got, f from 1964 up to the present day, we've got a lot of attempted Mars missions, the majority of which actually failed. Yep. Um, most of these were either flybys or um, orbiters, uh, and we've got we've got a number of craft which are currently allegedly in orbit around Mars. Um, it's all in this all in this table on the screen there, uh, and we've got a number um, of craft which have landed on Mars, uh, starting from the, with the Viking mission in 1976. Just tell us a little bit about the about the Viking mission, uh, Andrew. Yeah, the, so the Viking mission uh, arrived in Mars at Mars rather in 1976, consisted uh, of two orbiters and two landers, um, and uh, they were landers rather than rovers. So they, you know, once they got onto the surface, they stayed at the, in the same place. Mm -hmm. um, that those missions cost one billion dollars mm -hmm. so you know going back to 1976 that's that's an awful lot of money mm -hmm. um, and uh, they had color cameras on them 
they had a like a, a laboratory chemical laboratory built into them so one of the projects was to send an arm out into the soil dig some soil pull the soil into the or dust or whatever you want to call it pull it back into the probe and drop it down into like a uh, you know a sort of chemical analysis laboratory and they did this uh, labeled release experiment mm -hmm. uh, and so forth um, so you know quite sophisticated probes the missions were we were told they were a success you know everything worked they landed where they were supposed to land and we got quite a lot of good quality pictures from them right. it was that mission which first photographed this alleged face on Mars from orbit, not not from mm -hmm. the surface. They photographed that from one of the orbiters, mm -hmm. uh, and the region became known as Cydonia. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we'll come on to some of the photographs which appear mm -hmm. to have been tampered with um, from the, the Viking mission. Now they conked out in the early 80s. They lost their right. power, what have you. And then we've got a gap up until the mid 90s where we have Pathfinder, and you can see the various different sizes of what were called the the rover missions. So these are vehicles which can allegedly move around the surface of Mars, starting, as I say, with Pathfinder in I think it's 97. Uh, yeah, that's right, 97. Is right, okay, so yeah. that only lasted for a year or two. Yeah. Then we've got another gap to the mid 2000s where we've got um, uh, Spirit and Opportunity, which were right. a, a pair of rovers, which yes, lasted, um, well, lasted a good number of years. In fact, um, the Opportunity rover is still allegedly active. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's, we can see on the screen there the Opportunity rover. Uh, and then we've, we've we then had uh, the um, the Phoenix uh, lander, yeah. Phoenix, that was just a la lander. That's lander. Right, that was, yeah, that only operated, I think, for about three months or something. You've got that on your graph right, there. Yeah. And, yeah. So and, and then the most recent one, which is Curiosity, yes. which we're, we're going to so we're going to look at the Curiosity and the Opportunity rovers, which right. are allegedly still. Um, Sending back pictures sending from Mars, yeah, and, yeah, and, and, allegedly and, yes, and, and and you know moving around the surface right. of Mars now. We're just, um, I've got a section on the um, power ratings of the of the Opportunity rover, and um, in, in in the um, in the document I compare it to a mobility scooter um, because the weight of the um, of the Opportunity rover is 185 kilos, right. which is probably two largish people. Yeah, so yep. it's it's reasonably heavy. Yes. Um, so you would you would imagine if you were to compare it to let's say a mobility scooter, which I think is probably a good comparison. Yes. Um, obviously, uh, things weigh less on Mars. I think it's a factor of um, two point six times less on Mars. So okay, yes. it's it's maybe not one hundred and eighty five kilos equivalent load, um, but um, a mobility scooter maybe has a let's say an eighty kilogram person. It's it's comparable. Now a mobility scooter uh, typically t uh, consumes around about five hundred watts of power. Now the Opportunity rover is rated at just 100 watts, which is no more than a sewing machine. So, in, in, in the other um, thing which I go into detail in the document is or, or, is, the, is how the batteries are charged with with just two solar panels, which are delivering just 100 watts only for four hours a day, and this system has lasted for 10 years. Yes. Now, just think of your laptop battery, right? Because that's a, it's probably comparable. Uh, or maybe something slightly larger, it lasts in 10 years of charging and discharging. The, the life of the batteries, because the Opportunity rover is supposed to have been roving uh, around on Mars now for 10 years, um, powered by one rechargeable battery. Lithium-ion battery. Uh, yes, and since when did those last 10 years? You take those power figures and it does, it does make you scratch your head a little bit. Uh, you know, of course, they will argue. Oh, well, you've got highly optimized electronics and drive systems, and you know, um, we use uh, very low friction bearings in the motors. You know, it's been specially designed for this project mm -hmm. and so forth. But when you do the numbers, you know, you start to, like you say, the 100 watts for four hours a day, and then also the so solar panels. You know, if they're providing 100 watts of power allegedly for, as you say, for four hours a day. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem very much, and also the th thing that came into my mind is these things are on Mars, so the sunlight is going to be what, you know, 20, 30, 40 percent weaker there. Mm -hmm. uh, allegedly, the atmosphere is more dust laden, so how much 
more efficient of those solar panels got to be mm -hmm. than they would have to be on Earth. I mean, here's another interesting uh, fact. The rover's operating temperature is minus 40 to plus 40 degrees centigrade. So right. presumably that's, they've been tested to operate in that range. Um, the average surface temperature of Mars is estimated to be minus 55 degrees C. That's the average temperatures of, of Mars. At the equator, which is obviously the hottest point, temperature varies from 20 degrees C maximum to minus 73 degrees minimum. <laughs> so, the, so the temperature that they're on Mars at, minus 73, is way below the minimum operating temperature. So, and, um, and that's right. And then you also consider in terms of if anybody has ever taken their, their um, radio out into cold weather or a, a torch, trying to switch it on, you'll find that the battery performance at those sorts of temperatures is very much reduced. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's literally got to put it in your pocket to get the battery going yeah. again with a pocket torch or whatever. Yeah. Anyone can try that. So how are they getting this power system to work? So, so the types of batteries used uh, is a lithium-ion battery, so it's, it's nothing special. It's what you would find in a lot of laptops and mobile phones, and it's lasted over 10 years being charged and discharged probably every day. Yeah. And they're only charging it with, for four hours a day with a 100-watt a, a max, probably, solar panel. So and, I mean, I've, you know, I've pointed out with the Apollo missions, the rover, the Apollo rover that they used, the battery technology on that was operating mm -hmm. way out of the specified mm -hmm. temperature on the high end, you know, on the moon, you know, and that's in their own documents. So, yeah, you've got some serious questions here, certainly. Uh, and, it, you know, if we just go back to the comparison that I've made in the document, imagine putting a mobility scooter on the moon, right, with a couple of solar panels on it. How long is it going to last without plugging it into the mains? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, I don't buy it. Right. Um, all right, um, let's have a look at the Curiosity rover. Now, this is a different beast altogether. It's much bigger, more sort of the size of a car, um, much more highly powered. And this is the one that the, there was big fanfare a few years back when it, when it allegedly landed on Mars. And we're, we're going to look at that in a minute. Um, but it uses a different power system, Andrew. D um, this, is, this is using some sort of um, uh, nuclear uh, right. uh, um, isotope yeah, uh, I mean, power I system. The system, as I understand it, is basically uses some type of thermocouple, doesn't it, where you have you have the cool temperatures on the outside of the vehicle and then you have the warmer temperature which is created by the radioactive decay from the mm -hmm. isotope and then you have a thermocouple set up between those two points and that provides a current from the temperature difference. Uh, that's my right. understanding. So it's works. right, I've said here, while it seems uh, plausible that a radioisotope electric generator could provide enough energy to power Curiosity rover, the Opportunity rover seems uh, unfit for purpose by comparison. So. Um, Let's just talk about the testing of these vehicles, because um, I've uh, worked in my career as an engineer for the best part of 20 years and been involved in a lot of testing of products. And what I set out in the document is, is the philosophy that you use when you test products is in that you have a separate test department and design department, and they're not really supposed to collaborate with each other because you look at the requirements of the product the test department uh, will have its own engineers who devise the test procedures and carry out the tests separate from the designers because there's always a chance that both sets will interpret the requirements incorrectly and therefore it will pass a test without complying with the requirements. So there's yes. all these things. And the videos that I've seen put out by NASA, they just seem to be one big happy family there. It doesn't right. seem that they're doing independent type of testing that I, that I could see in their videos. Well, they appear to show some scientists working hard to uh, to develop the rovers, but um, there's absolutely no documentation, no film footage of, of, of any of the development stage, or very little documentation and footage of the development of the rovers. Um, and particularly, of course, the landing stages, the, um, I think it's the Curiosity rover, um, had a very complicated six-stage um, landing procedure. Uh, that was, you know, we were discussing this earlier and it does, I mean, from the videos you they put out, it's more like a, it does look more like a PR exercise mm -hmm. and sort of, you know, patting themselves on the back mm. rather than some type of rigorous, you know, 
type of audit test where somebody is actually pinning these people down and checking mm -hmm. that the systems meet the, the, yeah. the, the user requirements, you know, and uh, that these systems are working as designed, you know. I, I would expect a device like a, a rover to probably have several test specifications, each um, with hundreds, if not thousands, of tests to test against mandatory requirements. Uh, all signed off, all, uh, um, but what all we've got is a few videos from NASA. Uh, we, we can look at this one that they've put out, which was the drop test. Oh yeah. So we'll just we'll just have a look at this now. Five, four, three, two, one, fire. So big fanfare, but um, what actually happened in that test? We saw something kind of blowed to the ground. Now, I've worked on uh, systems which lower nuclear weapons into Trident submarines, right? And when we're, when we're testing th that type of equipment, they're operating within, let's say, certain acceleration parameters and velocities. So you don't know that the things pass the test until you've got your test data back. Because what we used to do w when I was at uh, Faslane Nuclear Base, we put a 125 ton bag of water on the end of a crane and we'd drop it and then see if the braking system worked and, and it, the accelerations would be measured. And then you wouldn't know until afterwards it's passed the test. You certainly wouldn't stand there clapping your hands. So it just, <laughs> I don't buy it, you know. It's it, right. I mean, the, if you watch that video, which I think is the test of this this so-called sky crane drop mechanism from mm. which was used allegedly used in the landing of the Curiosity rover. Yeah, I mean it's like oh you know it's like they've set up this rig, they've dropped something down, mm. and they're looking up. Oh, it hasn't broken. You know, therefore it's, <laughs> it's passed the test, test. You know, <laughs> so yeah. that's what it looks like to us. I mean, you know, again, but there may be things that we can't actually see, but. Why can't we see more of those, somebody, you know, going through a list of checkpoints, you know, on a list, or like you say, measuring the acceleration of this component and, you know, the stress on that component, you know, and what, what have you. We don't really see that, certainly not in the video. So, again, and I think one of the things we're talking about, Richard, isn't it, is having some type of independent verification of, of NASA's claims. Now, let's come on to the outside area where they've allegedly used to test some of these rovers, known as the Mars Yard. So we'll just put some photographs up on the screen. And um, it's not the most impressive test site in the world, is it? I mean, what are your thoughts on it, Andrew? Well, like you say, I mean, I... You know, it's one of those things, a bit like the Apollo pictures. When you look at them, they seem plausible when you look at this it seems like a plausible test area but when you you know when you were pointing out for example that your your own experience of going on test sites for some of the projects you've been involved in the past and I I've been on one of those two one or two of those sorts of projects as well probably not to the extent that you have but yeah it's true you you, you would have some more you'd have more security you know you'd have more um, equipment sort of set up it does. It doesn't really look that that. Uh, As you that said impressive. earlier, you're talking each of these rovers, whether they're the test yeah. rover or, or the actual rover, you're talking multi millions of pounds that's each. Right, so right, there's not even right. doesn't even look like there's any security there. So someone yeah. could just come in and steal it. So it, it just doesn't look like a comprehensive environmental testing site to me. Um, right. Well. We've, we've yet to come on to the most damning evidence, by the way. I mean, this, right. is, this is really just, it's just background, just background what, yeah, we're, yeah. What, we're, what we're discussing at the moment. Uh, a rocket was launched at Cape Canaveral on the 26th of November, to November 2011, and it got to Mars in August 2012. And this was filmed, or the, the Curiosity team sitting behind their consoles, which I find a little bit intriguing because you've got all of these operators sitting behind consoles, supposedly, uh, looking at different parts of the mission of this craft as, it, as it's going towards the surface of Mars. But we know that a signal from Earth to Mars takes at least three minutes. So that's six minutes to get there and to get back. So if they were to um, modify any sort of part of the mission, it's a, it's a six minute feedback loop. So they're, they're not looking at a live image. So I would have thought the vast majority of the program to land the thing, or if not all of it, would have to be completely pre-programmed mm -hmm. and not automatic. So I ask the question: Well, what are what are all these operators doing? If you you know if, if there's some buffeting in the atmosphere that this thing is going through, 
and they need to respond to it. Now it's going to be six minutes later when this thing's already gone yeah. thousands of miles off course and yeah. you know potentially crashed. So they must have done some very good modelling and you know had a lot of good data as to how that thing was going to come down. Mm -hmm. I mean I think when when they have the press conference, which you know we're recommending that people watch that that landing yeah. press conference. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk a bit more about that in a minute, yeah. but. They say, I think within that, they say they landed within about 50 metres or something, or 500 metres of the target area, which is, if you're going all the way to Mars, that's mm. pretty incredible. Right. You know, are they just good engineers and skillful mm. people, you know, with the uh, mechanics and so on? But There is a video which allegedly shows the craft kind of um, going down to the Martian surface, and then there's another photograph which they claim to be a Curiosity rover on the end of a parachute. So how, how would, because people who would say that these m missions did land on the, on the, on Mars, they would cite these two pieces of evidence, both the video and the photograph of the with the parachute out taken by a, a Mars orbiter. In some ways, the the, the difference between the uh, the uh, Apollo deception and and the rover's deception is CGI, <coughs> which is why the pictures we're seeing now are so much more convincing. Um, JPL themselves, the Jet Propulsion Lab, have, have actually developed um, um, software called uh, Virtual Presence in Space technology, which is uh, cutting edge CGI um, beyond anything we've seen in the movies. Um, it's, yeah. <laughs> isn't anybody wondering why? There's a conference, and I recommend you watch the whole conference. Uh, and this this was the 2012 landing briefing, so it's the the conference after they've supposedly successfully landed the uh, Curiosity rover on Mars. And mm. one of the main speakers there was this guy Adam Steltzner. Um, so the, 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 they were being asked questions by the press, and l let's let's just have a look at this little clip of, of Adam Steltzner, who's one of the lead engineers. I think he su he supposedly divide the devised. The, the, the sky crane, yeah. The, the method by which the thing is actually landing. That's right. He so, he was the guy who sort of pushed for the sky crane uh, system to be used. Yeah. Right. So let's just let's just take a look at this. Um, Adam, uh, tell us about the landing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Greg. Um, I can't tell you too much about it. I mean, it looks good. Uh, I'm being a little flip. Uh, in short, it looked extremely clean. Uh, we had, uh, yeah, <laughs> we had, uh, we had, we touched down in conditions that were um, on the more benign side of our nominal expectation. Our, um, it did, by, by the way, I want to preface everything. This is preliminary data scooped with the sieve in the cacophony of the control, control room. room during the celebration, right? And largely by my good friend Miguel San Martin, who's somewhere out there, I hope. At any rate, um, very nominal, uh, remarkably good. Uh, um, our navigation error was uh, was on the low side of our expectation. What? <laughs> I, I have to ask you, what kind of file type? Can you tell us about the image file type and compression that was used to send this very important uh, couple of thumbnails back from Mars? Yes, unfortunately, I absolutely cannot. <laughs> <laughs> if Justin Mackey is in the room, or there's a couple other people on the team who'd be able to whip that out quickly, but I, I don't, couldn't tell you. Sorry. So the guy, he doesn't even know what format the images are in that have been sent back to the Earth. There's no evidence of any, uh, any real science going on there, as far as I can see. I would expect someone who's the lead engineer on that project to know every single minute detail about, about the, well, the file formats, the software, everything. He should, and and it, it appears to me that he knows nothing. It is very strange when you listen to what he says, and I think the argument would be made that he wasn't responsible for the imaging technology that was used, he was just responsible for the landing mechanism. Even so, I would expect him to have an interest in the imaging technology mm -hmm. because that's what his lander is being used for, to get the images, mm -hmm. for heaven's sake. So, 
you would expect him to be interested more enough to, to be able to answer that question. In fact, that's a theme in that, that question and answer session, isn't it? Mm -hmm. There are several questions which, to me, say, seem fairly, you know, they should be able to answer them, really, and they can't answer them. Now, uh, which I think sheds light on how this cover-up, if it is a cover-up, and if the hypothesis is true, is, is operating, because um, I think Stelzner probably believes that that thing went to Mars and landed on Mars. So it's a combination, in my opinion, it's a combination of his, of his um, ego and him actually fooling himself that that's happened. Uh, so he's probably been recruited. They've maybe done a personality profile on people who they are recruiting for these lead positions and maybe people further down the chain perhaps know that the thing isn't landing on Mars and the vast majority of them on, on the team are being duped. Mm -hmm. that, that's just my opinion, which, which you'll see why I think that um, later on in the, in the programme. Yeah, and I mean, I, I have to say that, uh, you know, when we spoke about this, um, and I'm still kind of hedging my bets on this one, I'm not, I'm not uh, saying that the rovers aren't on Mars. Andrew's on the fence. <laughs> I'm on the fence, yeah, I'm definitely on the fence, and I don't mind saying that in this, this case. But like you say, when you stack these things up that we're looking at, it really gives you pause for thought and it, yeah I think the problem is that you think well what's happened to all this engineering effort what's happened you know they've spent all this money and everything and we've got these images which are allegedly from Mars but what really are they what are we really seeing and what have they really done and that's what's hard to believe that somehow they could have they could have um, done all of this as a fake. It's hard to believe that it, that it, is, that right. it could, could have been a whole fake. Now, now let's, come on, let, let's, let's come on to the images. You mentioned yes, the images, yes. and let's come on to them. Um, just to point out, all of these images that I'm going to show you are from NASA's published um, websites, and I've got the reference numbers yes. for the images, uh, which will be put on the screen, so you can look them up yourself from NASA's website. Now, the first one we're going to look at is a Curiosity rover image. Um, image number PIA16204. We'll put the whole image on the screen there and you can see I've got a little red square marked at the left hand side of the screen there because some of the evidence in these images is quite hard to see when you look at the whole the whole landscape. But let's just zoom in to that little area that I've highlighted there and what do we see on the screen there between these two rocks? Uh, well uh, there appears to be a small rodent in the, uh, in the picture. Right. Um, well, in my opi opinion, that's some kind of rod rodent, Andrew. What yeah, I mean, I'd seen this picture before, actually, before we had this conversation, and it is very strange that uh, you see that image and you think, well, is that just a chance, you know, line of sight effect that we're seeing? Or mm -hmm. it really does look, uh, as you say, like some type of lemming or... It's the Irish, they found it in a video on YouTube, I think by Monty Williams. Um, he thought it was a prairie dog but it did if you look closely it's not a prairie dog uh, I, I came to the conclusion that it was most likely a, a lemming that's the closest match uh, and interestingly enough um, one of the places where um, NASA test or claim to test their and develop their rovers is in in the Canadian Arctic at a place called uh, Devon Island a 300 mile long deserted Arctic island um, with a 23 kilometer meteorite crater in the middle of it um, and there are indeed collared lemmings it even looks like the right subspecies of lemming right. with a tiny mark on its collar it's, it's very very unusual and the lemmings have, have tiny little limbs because um, they live in such a cold environment they have tiny little limbs they can, they can kind of curl up in their own fur um, and, and indeed in the photo you, can, you can't see any limbs no. Um, one of the rovers uh, um, was tested. It is known that they've done tests on a place called Devon Island. Yes. This is yes. the largest unpopulated island in the world, very, very remote. But one of the creatures which is resident on that island and seen regularly is the Arctic lemming. <laughs> yeah. And there's yeah. a we've got yeah. a picture of one on the screen there. Um, so, is are we looking at in the Mars image a picture of a lemming? On Devon Island. Well, this is the question that we need to present ourselves with, don't we? And mm. I mean, that say Devon Island is northern Canada, isn't it? So mm -hmm. um, it's in that sort of area, so it is very remote. Mm -hmm. Let, let's have a look at this next image. 
Um, again, it's 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 uh, not, well. I'll give the um, reference zero one zero nine MR zero six eight four zero two two treble zero E one NASA image, and just to the right hand side there, if we if we zoom into that. Uh, well, again, it wasn't me who initially spotted it. Um, it was somebody on YouTube saying that it, it looks it looks like a backbone, like a, a line of vertebrae, some kind of uh, marine species, probably. Clearly, it's some sort of vertebrae. Um, that's not a random rock formation, in no. my opinion. Um, I would agree with that, and, and I've shown I've shown that image myself in one or two of the presentations that I've done. Yes, pretty difficult to describe that as a random rock formation. Yeah, exactly. How, how would a, um, an image of a vertebrae work itself into the Mars images? Well, again, it's perhaps it is somewhere like Devon Island where they've tested some of these rovers a whale that's been beached or, or, or one theory is that um, we get what are known as walrus graveyards where um, hunters will come and kill a load of walruses and they'll take the tusks and all of the stuff that they want and then they'll just leave the bodies to rot so you'll get vertebrae lying around the ground as we see there um, and we see here on the screen a picture of a whale skeleton so um, we're not biologists so we can't we haven't really identified where what type of creature uh, the vertebrae is from but um, S certainly pretty conclusive to me that that's some animal that's died that's well, been, I mean, been on earth right and I mean you know this brings us to the point of there are a number of these images and we're going to come on to some more so we have two alternatives really either we're looking at images from Mars mm -hmm. and Mars once had creatures you know like whales like walruses uh, going around in its oceans or seas or whatever or we're looking at images from from the Earth, uh, which are purported to be from Mars, and either of those two is gives us a problem with the official story of. Well, what's going well if you look at the lemming, it would it would say it has to have the life the same as right. Earth now. Yeah, how can a lemming exist in the Martian atmosphere yeah. with? What is it? Less than one percent. Minus seventy-three degrees centigrade, yeah. or whatever. So there's a there's a few other remarkably bone-like. Um, rocks uh -huh. um, that have turned up in the photographs. Uh, well, let's, let's turn to that one because yeah. we've got that one next. The, the so best, best match I could find was, was walrus bones. So Douglas Gibson has actually suggested that, that this bone on the surface of Mars is actually a walrus arm bone. But the, that wal walrus fore forearm definitely seems to be the best match. Right, so you think... But if anyone knows, knows, knows more about yeah. sea, sea mammalian um, um, bones, uh, yeah, we can happy to be corrected. Yeah. We can see the image there of a walrus skeleton. It does look very similar to some sort of arm bone of a, of a sea creature such, such as a walrus. It does, and I mean that particular image I'd not seen before. I saw it in your document, the one of this. It does look like a bone, you know, a hip bone or a thigh bone or something, or the walrus equivalent of whatever they would call it on a walrus. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, very unusual. If, if they are faking it, they, they would have to do it in extremely remote parts of the world um, and interestingly in some of the remotest arctic regions what they call the the arctic desert regions of the world um, you can find what they call walrus graveyards because walrus is the, the, the early hunters a couple of hundred years ago they only they didn't even have to go out to sea they could just find a, a huddle of walruses because they, they crawl up on, on the land uh, and shoot the whole lot of them and just take the tusks mm -hmm. So we've got lemmings running around, we've got um, dead walruses and uh, dead whales, and we've got lumps of wood, and are we really suggesting that all that life is existing on a Martian atmosphere with less than 1% of the Earth's, well, atmosphere and carbon dioxide? It's, 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 it's not an atmosphere that can support life like on Earth. So where are these images really being taken? It makes you wonder. All right, we'll come on to the next image, um, which is, as I said, uh, what appears to be uh, a lump of wood. Um, That's it. You were all, you were aware of this image, Andrew? Uh, yes. B b before you've seen the document, yeah. Yeah, I mean this this particular image. I'd used this in several presentations I'd done in two thousand, probably two thousand five, two thousand four, that sort mm. of time period. Not long after it had, had come out, I saw it posted on the internet forum, and it, you know, it looks like a, a lump of three by two. Mm -hmm. you know? 
<laughs> so, and this has come from the Opportunity Rover. Yeah, yeah, and it's in a panorama image that you can find. But again, it's, it's a black and white image. Why aren't they giving us colour? You know, as we were saying earlier on, that's mm. a plank of wood. Yeah. Let's uh, see. One, one of the other places, if they are using a very remote place on Earth to 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 fake it. Um, one of the other likely locations uh, would be Svalbard or Spitsbergen. Um, Th this is another test site. In the, yeah, in the where they've also the tested, tested lots, tested lots of um, uh, Mars rovers, done lots of development work. Um, and on on Spitsbergen, um, there are indeed quite a lot of uh, old um, uh, railway sleepers that have been uh, washed up because um, there's been a, a lot of mining on Svalbard right. over the centuries. All right, so that could be from some sort of railway slip because if you were to get hazard, it's not, it doesn't look like, like a fallen tree, it looks like it's no, been... No, it um, looks like a cut like sleeper. A, yeah, uh, Andrew said a piece of three by two. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is the deal with these why are we getting so many black and white images we you know you've got phones in your pocket that you know take high resolution digital color images you know why are we not getting these images from mars yeah okay um and another black and white image we have here which is um, from the spirit rover image got the reference there which appears to show lich lichen, lichen. Li lichen. Yeah. yeah. It just looks like lichen. Um, I, you know, <laughs> what else can it be? <laughs> uh, now again, if that was in colour, we'd probably it'd probably be absolutely conclusive that that was lichen. And we've got an image there which is comparing it to lichen on Earth. And lichen is this sort of parasite which grows on other things. Sort of like a type of fungus, you know, algae type of thing. I mean, the, the botanists I'm sure will pick me up and they'll tell me it's not a fungus and it's not mm. an algae, but it's it's that type of growth, you know, it's uh, yeah. it's not, it doesn't really have uh, flowering leaves or anything like that. It grows on rocks mm. primarily, you don't really notice it growing in soils and that. There are some, some kinds of lichen that, that, that actually grow in the little gaps in the rock which you can see. And then there's a nice round one growing on the surface. I don't know exactly what the different species, subspecies of lichen are. Uh, and now we come on to images of, of fossils. One of the ones that Charles Schultz mentioned, um, which he says is a crinoid. Um, but far more compelling really is, is, um, is a man called Richard Hoover, uh, who's uh, studied fossils all his life and worked for NASA for 40 years and he says it is absolutely definitely a crinoid. <coughs> so the guy who's working for NASA, is he therefore saying that there's crinoid fossils on Mars or what's he saying or is he saying they're fooling us with images from Earth? Does he, does he make a judgment on that? No he doesn't. Right, he just <laughs> says it's a, okay. Perhaps he's worried about his pension. People who are experts on fossils have looked at this image and can conclude that it's a, a crinoid fossil. And we've just got it next to a crinoid fossil there. And you can see the similarities with these sort of ridges. It isn't the logical c conclusion that the photographs are coming from the Earth rather than Mars? Because these, these are Earth species of fossils. Um, I think the best one was a crinoid. Yeah, I mean, this is something, again, I became aware of on Charles Schultz's site, or, or one similar to this. It might not have been this exact image, but he had some similar images. And I've shown them in some of the talk that I've done with trilobites and uh, there's one that looks like a fossilized octopus that he had as well so there's a number of these images that and he you know he points out as we were saying earlier that he'd gone through m you know hundreds or even thousands of these images and they're just like tiny little portions of the image you know that he's picked them out from they're not like really big so he's had to spend a lot of time looking for them mm. so charles schultz has written a book called the fossil hunter's guide to mars and right. he contends that the martian service is is got a lot of fossils on it Therefore, there's at one point on the Earth there was microbial or, or, or life, uh, yeah, not, my, not life microbial well, life, yeah. but life. Yes. Uh, and what we're saying in this hypothesis is, well, hang on. If someone showed you one of Charles Schultz's images, which appears to show a trilobite or a crinoid fossil, what, what would what would you what would you think it most likely an image from? Maybe yeah. it is taken from Earth. It's, it's certainly possible. It's certainly um, possible. Okay, now let's look at uh, this next image which shows um, a moving rock. So we've got, um, this is from the Spirit Rover, we've got one image which shows a, a, a collection of rocks and then another image taken at a different time from a slightly different angle of the same group of rocks and we see that there's a rock which has completely disappeared. Right. Which 
uh, we do get sandstorms on on Mars, but the well, this is it. I mean, we've we've already been talking, and we're going to talk uh, probably more about, about the the atmosphere on Mars. And you know, I've already said it's very thin. It's you know, much thinner than on the Earth. So therefore, any winds, you know, that are running on Mars, that are, that are, that are blowing on Mars, uh, they're going to be much less kind of force. On, on objects on the ground because it's the air less is than one percent th the thickness of the Earth atmosphere. Right, right. So it's not going to be able to blow a rock over. Not really, not really. So you have a problem with that idea of this just being blown over or whatever it is. So it's not quite so compelling. The, the pictures do seem to seem, seem very strange, um, but you can argue that it's a, it's a the, the apparent movement of the rock is a is a parallax effect. Um, that one of the rocks is actually standing quite a distance behind the other ones. Right. Um, for, for me, again, it's more interesting because th I'm pretty certain they've used CGI to hide something. Um, the rocks themselves look quite bizarre. All right, now there is another image that I've included in the document, which is an image of the Curiosity rover, and it's a self portrait. So the question to be asked is how did the thing take a photograph of itself without seeing the arm of the camera? Now, NASA have come up with an explanation for this one, and that is that there was 55 images stitched together um, which made that image, and that would also possibly explain why the rocks in the background appear different on two different shots. No, no it's just too perfect. No, no one's quite managed to perfect the process of uh, producing mosaics. NASA claimed that they've produced some software um, to produce a perfect mosaic uh, and also not, none of the 55 images which which could only have been taken by the um, Marley lens, M-A-H-L-I, uh, the Marley lens on the end of the robotic arm. Mm -hmm. um, none of those 55 images actually appear anywhere on NASA's own Right. raw image database and also they, they, they NASA claimed that the mosaic was actually put together by an amateur astronomer which seems to be a clever way of avoiding accountability and now we come on to um, another major area of evidence Andrew which is the the colors on Mars absolutely the, the, the first craft or lander was uh, the, the Viking mission and I think it was the first photograph that it sent back was uh, image PIA 00563 which showed a blue sky and a very slightly reddish or brown um, foreground. NASA then said, oh, well, we've made a mistake with that image. The sky isn't that color. This is how it is. So the, the, official, the, the official images or the revised images are seen below there, which is just completely red. So what, what do you make of that, Andrew? Yeah, well, I mean, we've seen many of these images now and, uh, you know, probably talk about one or two more. And that story of the image coming through is told by Richard Hoagland, and he said that when the image first came through on the monitors, it had like this bluish, greyish, or greyish blue, perhaps I would say, uh, sky colour. Mm -hmm. And then somebody said, "Oh no, that's not right, because the 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 dust is very thick there, you know, and uh, we better better recalibrate this image." And they twiddled all the knobs, and uh, lo and behold, the sky went red. NASA's explanation why they changed that image was that there was suspended dust in the atmosphere. So they're saying that that first image wasn't right because there was suspended dust in the atmosphere. So they've corrected it <laughs> to, to the second and one. How would they know? How would they know at that point? So early on, as we'll see, NASA have been changing the colours of their images on Mars. There's this uh, argument being running for years about whether the sky is really red because they can they can um, they can take a picture using the blue filter and tell us it was taken using using a red filter so then when we replace the red back into the picture it looks like the sky is red when it never was this is from spirit we've got they have actually a, a, a color calibration uh, module which uh, has four lobes on it and those should be blue orange green and brown in that image and that's how you tell whether the image is calibrated correctly. Just tell us about that. Yes, yeah, so we see this on a couple of the, and we saw this with some of the Viking images as well, where you have this colour calibration chart. And, uh, you know, you can see that these panels which were blue on Earth mm. have turned red when they're on Mars. Right. Now, this is not possible by reflected light. You can't, if you have a blue piece of paper or a blue piece of paint and you shine red coloured light onto it, it's not going to show up red, it's going to become like a muddy grey or something. But in these images, it's, it shows up red. Mm -hmm. And so what should be muddy grey shows up red. 
and that to me shows that there's been colour substitution of the blue colour range for a red colour range. Now, this is fairly well accepted with a lot of researchers that they are messing with the colours on Mars and they're making, they're deliberately making uh, the sky look red and the ground yes, look more yes. red. Yes, um, I mean we can we can say uh, that it's Gil Levin. He said this with analysis he's done. He designed one of the Viking experiments. Uh, Holger Isenberg, um, Goro Adachi. You know I've looked at this as well. But there's been a number of people that have pointed out these uh, these anomalies. And, and of course, there's two explanations, obvious explanations. The first is that the Martian sky is blue and they're trying to hide that fact and make it look red or it could be that the images weren't taken on Mars they were taken on Earth and the reason why they made them look red is so that they don't look too much like the Earth yeah yeah and I think a lot of the researchers who've said hey look the Martian sky is blue I think they could be barking up the wrong tree I it's think it's possible we're placing far too much faith in, in JPL and NASA and I think we only need to look at their background to um, decide whether they're really trustworthy <laughs>
we would say it's not or we would say it's not dust because it clears up a day or two later right so i mean you know we i i hadn't seen this image before you brought it to my attention i think it was douglas that mentioned it to you mm. and so yeah what, what are we looking at why is this is this dust i mean we don't really know for sure but what as my understanding they don't have any way of cleaning the lenses so if this dust is blown up from the surface and stuck to, somehow stuck to mm. the lens it should stay there forever you know there's no way to clean it off yeah. or until there's another sufficient gust of wind to blow it all off again which does is that what happened yeah. well there's no windscreen wipers there's no windscreen wipers that I'm, what I'm aware of right so also in this image we see if we look carefully at the soil and we animate the soil over a period of about seven days um, by putting one image um, next to the in a sequence mm -hmm. uh, we can see that clearly the soil looks like it's damp and is and is moving in a particular direction because so because that's the real giveaway you, you can see there's definitely something soaking away into the sand over the subsequent days I mean it's it's really glaringly obvious and yet NASA still still claiming there's no water on Mars so would you say that that shouldn't be able to happen on Mars either, Andrew? Well, it's not according to what they tell us about the atmosphere. I think it's just colour changes in the sand as, as the moisture drains into the sand. Um, I don't think the sand itself is actually moving. Right, right. I mean, one thing we did talk about uh, in, in email, I think, Richard, is to, to be more sure of this, we'd need to say, let's just say, for example, we were able to find out where these rovers really were, if mm. they were on the Earth. We would tr need to try and find out the weather conditions for that place and then see if we could match those with anything that was shown on the sequence of rover images. That's one thing we haven't looked at and uh, I'd be interested from anybody that, that uh, would, a, would, a, would be able to do that. Right, and we've got another pair of images there which were obviously taken at different times, slightly different angle, which suggests that perhaps the soil has moved from one yes. uh, to the other. And this, um, is, this is something that Charles Schultz has in, or he had on his website, I don't know whether it's in his book, that we've seen, we can see clearly see evidence that it looks like there's been some type of water flow which has smoothed over some of the grooves on the ground, you know, the channels that are filled up with silt. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's pretty clear to me that this, this is what's happened in these right. images. Um, now we come on to the cleaning events because I think it's the um, Opportunity Rover, its solar pan panels became dusty and therefore they weren't um, uh, getting as much power and the, and the thing conked out I believe is that is that correct at some point yeah very nearly conked out um, I think you even claimed that the the memory on the rover was starting to malfunction because due to lack of power and then uh, miraculously um, the uh, the solar panels were suddenly clean again right so the solar panels were suddenly clean now they put this down to some kind of sandstorm just to tell us about that uh, Douglas yeah well they, 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 they've, they've given us photographs of with dust devils going past in the background so they're claiming that these dust devils have been periodically cleaning the solar panels um, but actually there's an article in New Scientist saying that um, all these cleaning events have happened in the middle of the night mm -hmm. um, which um, seems unlikely with if, 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 yeah, if yeah. dust devils is the... Uh, the dust devil will be more likely but to occur during the day. You think? That's right, but also the Martian atmosphere is 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 something like one two hundredth of the density of the Earth's atmosphere. Um, so you, any wind is going to be one two hundredth times say, exactly, less yeah. powerful. Exactly. Right. So it's difficult to think how something like that could clean a solar panel that's become covered in dust. That's right. And in some of the images, or um, people have alleged that the cleaning has been highly selective. In that, the, the, some of the hinges. There's a photograph where the, you showed me of some of the hinges of the of the rover appear to be sparkling clean with no dust on them, and the solar panels, more dust on them. Just That's right. There was a very very interesting article by Ted Twitmeyer um, saying that the the some of the Solar panels appeared to have been cleaned, whilst other ha others hadn't. Uh, also, the, the the hinges on the sol solar panels appeared to be clean when the sol solar panels were still dirty. And he he even believes he, there are um, fingerprints in the in the dust on the solar panels. Right. 
So we can have a look at this image here, which appears to show a finger or a thumbprint on the edge of the solar panel. If we just zoom in on that, and one thing I was going to do is perhaps do some calculations on that, what appears to be a fingerprint, just to see if it's the, it's the right size for a fingerprint. It certainly seems unlikely that if, if a solar panel has got so dirty that it can no longer recharge a battery, uh, that it's m starting to malfunction, that, that suddenly <laughs> it all comes back to life again. If, if, if you park your car in the street for six months, it gets really dirty, does it ever end up clean again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good analogy. <laughs> well, I suppose the rain might, but then of course there's no rain on Mars. So. Yeah. Now, um, I've included some of the NASA images from Apollo uh, just to show that w that you can that you that there's proof that that NASA do fake their images right uh, on the moon landings yeah so we're just going to look at a few of them now so this is evidence of previous faking that's why I've put this in a chap called David Percy has taken four NASA images which is NASA image AS1713420437 to 20443 and he stitched them together because they're, they're different sections of, of yeah. the moon uh, and then he's taken another set NASA image AS1714722494 to 22521 and he stitched those together so he's got two uh, composite images and he's compared them and we can see there uh, tell us the anomaly that we're looking at. Yeah, so that image is essentially we have a problem with the parallax because the backdrop for those two sets of images is identical um, or it's very nearly identical and yet in one image we have the lunar module in the foreground very close, to, fairly close to the camera and then in the other it's way over to the right and we have an, an astronaut, whichever one it is, I don't know, in the foreground. Mm. Yet the backdrop is identical as if we're you know, what are the chances of having the camera pointed with exactly the same field of view? And just to explain the problem with that, Andrew, and that is that the, the lunar lander that you see there in the foreground lands on the surface of the moon, and then when the astronauts leave, the top part kind of explodes away, and then they get back to Earth. Yeah, so there's no so, way for it to move during yeah. after it's landed. So the lander can't move on the surface of the moon at all. It has yeah. to stay in the same position. We see it in two different positions on the same mission. Yeah. So... People have looked at this and have concluded that that, what you're looking at there, is a stage set with a front projection system uh, generating the, the artificial background on there. Right. Probably with the help of Stanley Kubrick. Something like that, yeah, because he was using that uh, method in 2001 on Space Odyssey around the same time. The, the Mars rover missions, or, or Mars rover deception in my opinion, is, is, is it's, uh, it's a continuation in many ways of the Apollo deception. All the evidence suggests that Stanley Kubrick faked a lot of the, the moon photographs um, on one of his big sets um, and perfected techniques for, for joining, or as best as possible, joining the foreground with the background to create the illusion of a whole landscape. Um, but of course, you can do that now using CGI. So you can have, you can film outdoors and put in whatever background you like. Mm -hmm. Um, which is exactly what I think they're doing, because obviously they the, the need to disguise whatever sky, whatever whatever is in the background, which is likely to give away their location. Um, they would need to replace that with something uh, less identifiable. Rich Planet Television is sponsored by MouseMesh.co.uk, protecting air bricks in homes from uninvited guests. All right, well, let's come on to another NASA image from the moon mission, which um, uh, <laughs> is supposedly a, photo, a family photograph on the surface of the Earth. And we, we have featured this one before. On the surface uh, of the moon. You just said you sorry, want to say that again, yeah. Well, it probably is the surface <laughs> of the Earth. But, uh, Freudian slip. Yeah. Um, yeah, we showed the famous clip of, of, of Andrew Johnson putting his family uh, photograph into the oven w along with his dinner. So um, here we have a uh, family photograph and uh, over here we have an oven and uh, this oven is set to 100 degrees centigrade and I'm now going to put this photograph in the oven which is cooking some of my dinner and then I'm going to watch it through the glass. And that you can see that in very short order, if 
trying to get a better light but you'll see it when I open it this is curling up within seconds so I think that's a pretty convincing demonstration and here it is you can see it there curled up and that's only at 100 degrees centigrade that's right and I could, I'd like to assure viewers I wasn't on the moon when I did that yeah. so, uh, <laughs> so just to explain why you put your photo, family photograph in, in, in the oven with your dinner yeah well this was again one that caught my eye because it's a photograph from NASA on the moon which you can look at based on the physical properties of materials rather than lighting effects mm. so the claim is that the photograph is on the surface of the moon uh, if you look up the official sort of temperature of the surface of the moon, it, the average temperature is 100 degrees centigrade. In sunlight, it's probably going to be 170, 180 degrees centigrade, mm. something like that. So, it's, as I said in the last show, it's higher than boiling water on yeah, the surface of the moon. Absolutely. So, if you have a piece of photographic paper, an ordinary photographic paper, it does what's called convolution, it convolves, it, it curls up. So that photograph should be curling up, that what we're looking at there, but it's perfectly flat, it doesn't, it's in a plastic bag which doesn't appear to have been, you know, if you heat a plat plastic bag with a hairdryer, you'll see it all starts to scrunch up or at least mm. change shape. We're not seeing any of that with that photograph, that is not on the surface of the moon. Mm -hmm. End of. Mm -hmm. All right, and then we've got another image here of a a lunar rover and there's all kinds of problems with the lunar rovers which we covered in a previous show the fact that they don't even fit into the lunar module uh, there's no tracks showing there um, various of the problems with the technology for example mm -hmm. the, t the operating temperature range of the batteries is completely um, out right so there's a, there's a lot of problems with the, the lunar rovers that's right again that's worthy of a little bit of study for people to, to look at the problems in those areas yeah definitely and, and, and that's just a few of the, of the faked NASA moon images. Let's now look at um, some of these uh, testing sites on Earth. L let's use the terminology that, uh, they, that they use at NASA. They call them a Mars analog site. Now I'm just going to read out what, what a Mars analog site is. It is a location on Earth where some environmental conditions, geologic features, biological attributes or combinations thereof may approximate in some specific way those thought to be encountered on Mars, either at present or earlier in the planet's history. Studying such sites leads to new insights into the nature and evolution of Mars, the Earth and life. So what they're saying is they're looking for places on the Earth which are a bit like what Mars might look like. Yes, and right. have similar conditions, you know, with a rocky terrain or, you know, cold temperatures uh, or very dry, mm. you know, and this sort of thing. Now, one of these sites is a place called Devon Island, which just so happens to be the largest unpopulated island on Earth. So they're, they're choosing extremely remote places. I'm sure they could find somewhere just as with the same weather conditions, which is a lot easier to access. Then nobody has ever lived to um, on Devon Island. There's, there's no flights to Devon Island? No, there's no... What about ships? Uh, well, you could sail there, um, I suppose. Um, Would you need they, they, they've, had, they've had to make their own tiny landing strip but the, to, um, to get supplies in and out. In the document, I, I suggest, in the hypothesis, why they're choosing these remote sites. And that's so that no one can actually come and photograph the landscapes that they're using for the faked Mars rover images. Right, because um, I mean these aren't places where you're going to go out for a Sunday afternoon no. trip or even on a, an expedition you know uh, with kayaks or whatever you you wouldn't go to these sorts of places. E even if you had your own helicopter you'd be hard pushed to get to some of these places. Um, one of them is, um, well the, the one on Devon Island is next to uh, the Horton Crater which is a huge ancient crater. When I, when I first looked at Devon Island uh, on my laptop screen with Devon Island filling my laptop screen, um, Horton Crater was a, a great big red spot, about six millimetres across, I just said, uh, right in the middle of the screen, a absolutely unmissable. And yet when I went back a week later to, to, to look closer, um, they changed the pictures so you, you now can't see Horton Crater. If you have the whole of Devon Island on your computer screen, the, 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 portrait, the crater is now completely invisible. I think they swapped a uh, a high altitude um, summer photograph for a winter photograph it's when it's when there's a slight covering of snow so all the red soil 
um, uh, and um, rock thrown up by the impact is no longer visible on Google Earth. That's also very interesting because it's alleged that the Mars rovers, or at least uh, one of them, is in the Gusev crater, in in uh, you know on Mars. On Mars. Uh, the Opportunity rover, yes, is supposed to be exploring the edge of a 23-kilometer crater on Mars. Right. That's a coincidence, isn't it? So I, when I read that in your document, I got, I didn't realise that, that that there was an impact crater on Devon Island or near you know near where this test station yeah. was. Uh, now, obviously, if, you, if you're faking the Mars photographs, you need somewhere extremely dry with no vegetation. Um, and practically the first meteorite crater I looked at um, was this 23 kilometre crater up on Devon Island in the Canadian Arctic. Um, so, so I just googled, it's called Horton Crater, and the third link that came up was, was, was NASA testing Mars rovers there. Um, now they would say, oh well we have to go to the most Mars-like locations to test our rovers. Um, but I'm not convinced. Uh, you'd be, they'd be better off testing them in the Mojave Desert, you know, right next to where the um, NASA headquarters are. Mm -hmm. So of course they they would argue that they yeah, uh, where they chose that site specifically because they knew they were going to send it to, uh, you know, a crated area on Mars. Right. That's why they chose that particular site. But yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, an extremely remote island which which they've now surrounded with high tech listening devices to um, keep away any unexpected visitors. They've been running, they're called the AMAZE Expeditions, A-M-A-S-E, Arctic Mars Analog Svalbard Expeditions that have been running for about 10 years, I think. Um, and they have been to a few different locations on Svalbard or Spitsbergen. Um, but they, us they usually seem to head towards a place called Bockfjorden, um, and also Woodfjord, and, um, which are also in what they call this um, Arctic desert region. It doesn't actually get very much snow at all. It's 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 Woodfjord, in particular, looks almost completely dry. Certainly on Google Earth. Uh, we've got other sites. One in um, Utah, which, if you look at these photographs of uh, the, the the Mars analogs, as they call them. Um, it it does look very much like the photographs that they've been sending back, um, both on Devon Island and in the the Utah one. And if you read, if you go on to, because um, we're going to come on to the the Mars Society in a moment. Oh yeah. And these these Mars analog sites, um, what they do is they get sort of a, a cylindrical tin can type building, and they'll install it in the middle of the desert in Utah or up in uh, Devon Island, and it has a few stories in it and their scientists will live there for months on end uh, because it, it, it simulates a landed spacecraft that they're living in, right? And uh, they act scientists actually compete to have a go in it, right? For, to live in it for sort of months at a time. And uh, they get these awards for... Uh, <laughs> for li so it's, apparently it's very, very prestigious for mm. someone studying uh, uh, universities to get their PhD who live in this tin can for six months mm. in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> And they actually get awards for it, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah. yeah, great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Whatever floats so, your boat, I suppose. Yeah, uh, it takes all sorts to make a world, doesn't it? It yeah. does indeed. Um, um, so, so tell us, where do you think Curiosity Rover actually is in reality? The Curiosity Rover has definitely explored, definitely past several walrus graveyards, in my opinion, which means it's most likely on Svalbard or it could be also be on Bear Island, um, which is between Svalbard and Norway, uh, which also has walrus graveyards and is relatively flat. What, well, what about the lemming image, though? Is that because that's well, they're using CGI to to join together various locations. Like I was right. saying, they can have one locate. They have to have one location in the foreground that they can use their robotic arm to microscopically examine, but they can have a completely different part of the world or even just CGI in the background some of the backgrounds some of the hills look right. distinctly unreal the spirit rover seems to have been done almost entirely on Devon Island I'd say <coughs> right um, the the curiosity you think is more likely to be Svalbard is that what you're saying the curiosity rover um, has the, I think they've used bits of Svalbard and a lot of the Atacama Desert right so let's assume that the hypothesis is correct 
I would imagine the best way to expose this conspiracy is for somebody to find where these landscapes have been filmed and photograph them and compare them so we can be absolutely sure and absolutely categoric of where they've, which landscapes they've used. Would you go along with that uh, Douglas? Yeah absolutely but um, the, what I found out fairly quickly was that of course they, they've been very very careful to um, to uh, use locations that can't quite be identified so um, even if there are any identifiable hills in the background they'll, they'll, they'll use CGI to, to put something really indistinct in the background. Mm -hmm. In fact that's, that's the kind of the d distinctive feature I've noticed of, uh, of all the photographs is the lack of distinctive features in the background. Right, but, but perhaps as we've seen with the fossils, the lemming, the vertebrae, sometimes they do slip through the net so um, maybe we can set a challenge, uh, the rich planet find Mars on Earth challenge to any budding explorers out there who might happen to have their own uh, seafaring vessel or helicopter <laughs> who, or light <laughs> aircraft who maybe want to try and find where some of these sites are and, and provide documented evidence. Assuming they are on Earth, um, Douglas, do, do you think they're faking it with just a camera or do, or do you think they've actually got a Mars rover there the whole thing simulated and, and it's at, so the images are coming from the rover or do you think it's just a guy with a camera and a tripod they're, they're, they're and, and using, they, can in, they can insert the bit of the rover that's seen they're using all the techniques sometimes the rover's there sometimes it isn't um, sometimes they're using CGI to stitch together various components to, to create a realistic landscape now when we've been recording these shows all about the Mars rover missions and the fact that they may have been faked, um, an article appeared in Mail Online and in other mainstream publications entitled I Saw Men Walking on Mars in 1979. Former NASA employee claims there was a secret manned mission to the Red Planet. So this is somebody who's ran Coast to Coast AM, which is an American radio program, and I think this caller called Jackie. This call was at least as long ago as 2007 because it was George Norrie interviewing John Lear and the last time John Lear was on that radio program was 2007 so they've dragged up this story from over seven years ago of a, a woman who claimed to work for NASA and who said that the Vi some of the Viking images had had people in them but it seems dubious to me because this person describes moving images and also dis uh, says that the, when the Viking uh, craft was moving around the surface of Mars well in fact it wasn't it was a stationary lander so I'm very skeptical of this uh, story Douglas but mainstream media have put this up um, strangely when when we are um, putting out this research one aspect that I particularly objected to in this article it says conspiracy forums have been set ablaze this week after a lady claiming to be a former NASA employee said she had be, uh, seen humans on Mars. Well, that's, it is bullshit because this, this call took place at least as long ago as 2007. So conspiracy foremans have not been set ablaze this week. Um, some people may have been talking about it on the internet because they put it in Mail Online and in other mainstream uh, publications. Certainly any, any person who read this article and thought there was at least some truth in it, w that would then muddy the waters for this because this does not mention the theory that the Mars rovers never left the Earth and the photographs are coming back from Earth. It, what it's saying is, hey, someone at NASA saw a person in one of the in one of the Viking images. That means there's a secret space program and people are walking around Mars. So it's not questioning for one minute the fact that Viking might not be on Mars, which is why it's disinfo in my opinion. The the problem I think is that the Daily Mail have tried to attach that story to. A really bizarre story about nuclear explosions on Mars. So they, they seem to try to lump her in with, um, yeah, and with a, a very bizarre story. Let's, yeah, as I said, we'll come on to the Mars Society. Why does NASA need a separate organisation, completely separate, to run these Mars analog sites where they're doing all of this research for the rovers and testing components and this kind of thing? Um, but this Mars Society, uh, it, it, it's, it actually says on the internet that. Um, it's not a company, it is, um, it is a not-for-profit organization and is funded fully by American organizations. 
which I would imagine means NASA. So they've created this separate organization called the Mars Society, which is running all of these um, Mars analog stations. So why do, why do they need a separate organization? And it's run by this guy, um, Dr. Robert Zubrin, founder of the Mars Society. Um, but yes, the, the Mars Society does pop up in all the right places to be, um, to be orchestrating some kind of uh, deception. You know, we could comment on some of his lectures. Have you seen any of them? Andrew? Not. I've heard him on Coast to Coast, but I've not. I've not seen his lectures, so no, I can't really comment on those. Right. Well, um, it, Z Zubrin is sort of a, a proponent of manned Mars missions. So what he's campaigning for is to try and get the funding and the motivation to build uh, rockets that can get to Mars, create some sort of little colony, and then get back safely. And he goes into all of the logistics as to how many spacecraft you'd need, the fact that you need to create artificial gravity on the way to Mars by spinning it round and creating gravity. So, but if, if you want my view on it, his lectures are just like a pipe dream. I'm going to talk humans to Mars within a decade, okay? And um, I'm going to talk a uh, little bit about. Uh, why I think it would have to be done in that kind of time frame if you're going to do it. I'm going to talk at some length as to how I think it could be done. In fact, I'm going to show you two different ways it could be done. Humans to Mars within a decade, okay? Is that really possible? NASA's current, I mean, uh, timeline is to do it around the year 2047. Mars Direct was actually conceived by a, a team led by me and another engineer named David Baker uh, at Martin Marietta, which became Lockheed Martin, in 1990. Uh, this is um, the mission sequence chart uh, for the Mars Direct Plan. You can launch to Mars every two years, and we're going to be launching two boosters every two years to Mars in order to do this. The, now, well, first of all, any space operation requires an appropriate launch vehicle. And uh, we set ourselves the task of designing one in the Saturn V class out of available technology, shuttle technology. So you have four shuttle main engines, a couple of solids, the external tank core, hydrogen and oxygen upper stage, and a 10 meter fairing, or uh, 33 feet if you work at Lockheed Martin. Um, and, the, uh, okay. um, and this could lift 120 tons to low Earth orbit. But more importantly, it could use this upper stage to send 47 tons on direct trans-Mars injection or 59 tons on translunar injection. And that is how we wanted to do the mission. Just lift and throw and let it go. Send the payload to the planet, the same booster that, that launched it in the first place. That's how we've done every real unmanned planetary mission. That's how we did the real Apollo missions to the moon. No one's ever done a mission to anywhere by lifting things to the space station and waiting for the interplanetary cruiser to return from Saturn and be refitted to load the payload on it and then go back out. No, just lift and throw and let it go. And the RV. And what this is, this is a little rocket ship for returning from Mars to Earth in the terminal stage of the mission. But no one's in it when it goes out the first time. Or uh, a crew of four for a six-month voyage from Mars back to Earth, landing site number three. So this is an actual photograph of the base. Um, <laughs> what you see here, here's the Earth return vehicle. Uh, there's the cabin, the two propulsion stages, the uh, um, intakes for the chemical processing unit, which is built into the landing stage that acts as the takeoff pad for the rest of it. Here is the reactor and the crater in the background, the habitat, upper stage where they live, lower, uh, the upper deck where they live, lower deck is the garage for the little pressurized rover, a couple of solar panels, uses backup power if you have to turn the reactor off. You also have backup power by running the engine of the rover or the light truck, which may be hard to see, but it's sitting over here. It's an unpressurized vehicle, which is also the backup for this one. And then this thing here is an inflatable greenhouse. This is not a mission critical element. It's an experiment in learning how to grow crops on Mars in Martian soil, Martian sunlight, Martian gravity, Martian water for the uh, benefit of future missions and future bases. Now, after a number of these missions have occurred in different places, you'll know where you want to uh, develop a, a, a major base and you could do that by uh, landing a lot of the HABs in the same place and mating them up. These are second generation HABs here who uh, landing legs can articulate not only up and down but also side to side. Um, using rocket technology to get manned missions to Mars I think is, I don't think they would achieve it with rockets, they need something more advanced and, and, and I suspect that the whole 
ethos of what he's doing masks as the secret space program which we've covered in other yes I, I, in other um yes and i mean when when i again when i read this mars society in your document i'm not i was familiar with zubrin but i didn't really know i just thought he was just like some space enthusiast i did not know that they were directly involved with you know managing some of these sites and that is very peculiar mm -hmm. and the thing that i'd add to that is that again what some people don't realize is that a lot of these uh, mars images have, have been through a private company before they get to the public of mm -hmm. mainly in space science systems at MSSS. Why are these images being released through a private company before they're available for public consumption? You know, mm -hmm. that's another huge question. And Zubrin did work for Lockheed Martin, who developed a uh, secret aircraft, and um, I wasn't able to find out what he actually did when he worked for Lockheed Martin. I've picked out a quote from one of Zubrin's lectures where he says, the idea that we cannot go to Mars until much more advanced propulsion systems that can get us to Mars in 30 days is, um, is not a valid argument and I believe it is disingenuous as well. Now, I find that 30 days quote very interesting because when I give my lecture about Ed Fouché's TR3B, I suggested that they've got, already got the capability to get to Mars within four weeks. It's a very similar time period. It is, so, isn't it? So does yeah. Zubrin know something um, that he's not letting on? Uh, because all of his lectures are based on rocket technology and not, nothing more advanced than that. So, I mean, that brings also, I think there's another group called the Planetary Society, which also has, I think, a similar kind of um, language about space exploration in general. Hmm. And um, I know that one of the people that's associated with that is Robert Picardo, so this is something I've got from uh, Car Carl James, mm. and he, he's been involved with uh, people at JPL as well, Robert Picardo, and he played the uh, holographic doctor in Star Trek Voyager. So that's, that's a connection worth looking into, and how that, you know, we, I think we're sort of just touching on a whole sort of other area of how this, how this um, perception management is, it operates, mm. you know, with these things like the Mars Society, the Planetary Society, which seem like these benign, you know, organizations intended to promote interest in the space program but they don't really they'll poo poo any 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 idea that the secret stuff that's, that's yeah. that you know is yeah. there yeah do you think this could be masking a secret space program is oh yeah quite possibly yeah you 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 actually think that physics changes as you get further f further away from Earth. So That's right. I, I don't think they can get anyone beyond the Van Allen radiation belts. Right, right. So for all you don't rule out the secret space program, you... you oh yeah, there may well be. Uh, uh, Anti-gravity so? definitely exists. Um, uh, I've got Victor Schauberger's book somewhere. His, his work was sequestered by the Nazis mm -hmm. uh, right back in the 30s. Um, or the, I think they called it torsion physics <coughs> right. which leads absolutely straight into your your work on the TR3B. Now in the final section I'd discuss what the reason might be so let, let, let's say that the hypothesis is true that they're faking all of these missions uh, to Mars um, one would imagine it's to conceal something which perhaps is on Mars and I've, I've listed what may be there um, evidence of past advanced civilizations, human or otherwise, inhabited man-made bases that have already been set up in secret, secret spacecraft or spaceports, the fact that the planet's makeup might be significantly different to accepted scientific theory, and I think Douglas Gibson is of that mind. The physics of Mars is probably completely different to Earth, <coughs> and that's essentially what they're hiding, what right. they don't want us thinking about. Right. So just, do you want to expand on that, as, as to what you think it might be like on Mars? Uh, well, my, my, my background is, um, like you say, in, a, uh, in the theosophy, mm -hmm. um, in the theos theosophical wor world view, um, rather than um, consciousness e evolving as a kind of peripherally around matter, uh, matter has evolved from consciousness. Uh, that sounds like a... <laughs> I'll be accused of being unscientific, but actually you, you can't prove either of those sets of assumptions. Yeah. It's just as valid to start from from the right, uh, right. that different standpoint. Yeah. You, you, let me let me share that with you then, uh, Douglas, because I've not uh, delved into a, a great deal into this thing called consciousness uh, on which planet. And 
scientists will agree or some scientists will agree that that in order to observe the universe observe everything that there is there must be consciousness and that consciousness must be detached in some way or different in some way from physical matter or even space so you have to have consciousness in order to experience the world and this consciousness element is possibly vastly underplayed or even completely ignored in modern science but what Douglas is saying is that, that consciousness is probably the most important of the two yeah consciousness itself is more fundamental than matter um, in my opinion um, the, 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 the problem kind of goes back to the, the split between um, alchemy and science about 500 years ago so science itself kind of grew out of alchemy. Newton himself started out as an alchemist. Um, what, what seems to be got forgotten along the way is that science itself can still be placed back within a larger alchemical um, context, if you like, mm -hmm. which does indeed say that when you travel certain distances away from the Earth, um, all our physical constants start to change. The speed of light becomes different which also ties in with um, Rupert Sheldrake's talk mm -hmm. uh, was it earlier this year there are other uh, things that people have suggested whereby the the, the non-physical element of, of humans our soul if you want to call it that it somehow resonates with the planet itself and, and that that by taking your physical body away from the earth you're disconnecting it from some kind of field, maybe a, a morphic field or or, a, or the akashic field, and that you you th that you would lose your marbles if you if you travel well, more than let's say a million miles from the earth. Well, exactly. I mean, I I try 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 to avoid sort of uh, terms like astral and try try to use modern scientific terms, which you can do instead. Um, but but just what you you were talking about just then in. Um, Nexus magazine in August, uh, they they had uh, an article about the strange experiences of the Russian cosmonauts mm -hmm. experiencing exactly the, the, the things you've just been talking about, altered states of consciousness once you travel a certain distance from the Earth. So there's there's a change in your consciousness and in matter itself. So the when you get to the Van Allen radiation belts, the the radiation you're experiencing isn't <coughs> it isn't really floating around in space. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is a, a kind of questionable concept in itself. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's actually radiation coming from the atoms of your own body, your own spaceship. It's the beginnings of this, um, I suppose I'd have to call it an alchemical change in, in, in the atoms of your body, but also in your consciousness as well. It's a change in the relationship between the two. Mm -hmm. um, it is very, very interesting. I mean, right. it's just a huge, it, it's a whole area of, of, of of science that that we're being very carefully um, steered away steered from, away from right. exactly and, um, and, and specifically if, by NASA and if it were true it would turn everything on its head absolutely you're you're saying that um, the, the, the cover-up in this is something quite profound and fundamental yeah. rather than just the fact that there might be aliens on Mars exactly you're it's saying it's it's something fundamental about the understanding of of everything that is absolutely it's, it's about the relationship between consciousness and matter what, what they used to call alchemy but which you can you can look at in in absolutely strictly scientific modern ways it is there's nothing um, unscientific or irrational about thinking about consciousness itself right okay um, and it changes everything when 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 you do what came first consciousness or matter exactly have we got a situation where the rovers are really on earth but the orbiters are really going on Mar going around mars mm. or are the orbiters not going around mars either mm. you know and we're seeing some other images that that's a question i think that would need to be resolved mm -hmm. um, or have they somehow managed to set things up such that you know we we're going to end up arguing about the authenticity of all the images and call all the images into question Mm -hmm. um, because this is something we've seen that happen with with 9/11 imagery as well, mm -hmm. which you know we haven't got time to go into. But so the the overall overarching thing I think is to cover up secret technology. That's mm -hmm. 
So the, these rover programs have now become the equivalent of Apollo in that a lot of good minds, you know, with highly skilled technical uh, abilities, detailed technical knowledge, they are now soaked up into those sorts of programs and they're not going to be sort of entertaining the idea of black programs, secret technologies and this sort of thing. They're all helping un unwittingly to keep all of that covered up. That It may just be that the rover program is all part of that perception management operation. Mm -hmm. it's, it, that's quite possible. It may well be that they put the rover on a rocket and then just crash it into the back of the moon or, 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 whatever, or, yeah. or you know into the ocean what, and then they're all being duped by Im by images that are being sent back by some other covert team right um, it's I think un 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 unless we have a completely independent uh, citizen based space program where Tom Dick and Harry can build their own craft and get it to Mars and then go and film their technology on Mars I'm not going to believe it mm. do you see what I mean yeah, independent yeah, verification yeah. And I mean, if we look at how difficult that is, I mean, if we take the, uh, we talked a little bit about this, of the recent crash of the Virgin uh, Spaceship 2 that, uh, that uh, broke up just mm. after it was uh, released from the plane. I mean, that's a kind of a civilian space program. Yeah. And what yeah. <laughs> it, 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 it's, I don't buy what happened there. It's, it, it, to me, they're trying to put into the public's mind that anything above the Earth's atmosphere is really difficult folks there's no way civilians can manage it right right whether Branson's in on that or not I don't know I, I've, I, I've stuck my neck out and said I'm 75% sure I think Andrew's right on the fence but you're you're convinced oh uh, yeah absolutely I, I, like I say I only spend intend to spend an hour uh, kind of dismissing the idea and the, 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 the whole subject every time I've looked just it's, it's, like, it's exactly the same as Apollo you, like I say you take any aspect and try and try and get to the bottom of the science behind it and and pretty soon it's everything's falling apart in your hands and, and, and once once you become convinced um, do you feel annoyed about it did oh I did initially yeah I mean you do the same as with Apollo this is this is the one of the biggest problems um, uh, what's, what's that famous saying? It's it's difficult to deceive people, but it's even harder to convince them that they have been deceived. Yeah. Because then, of course, their pride's involved. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so yes, when you try and broach a subject like this, people start getting angry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. And, and but you've you've got over that. Yeah. 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 I've I've got over it. You start. It, it comes to the point where you actually start to laugh at it. I, I did manage to get a photograph of um, the the operators. Uh, uh, taken from behind from behind their shoulders and we'll just have a look at what they're looking at on the screen remember believe none of what you hear and only half of what you see I'm Richard D Hall good night <laughs>